Hey everyone, welcome to West Coast Muscle Saws. Today I want to talk a little bit about the evolving world for the chainsaws, handheld equipment, as far and also as far as the lawnmower industry. Everything's evolving and changing. I uh, made my living uh, repairing small engines since the 70s, working on chainsaws and uh, went through a lot of schooling and everything. Everything's evolving and changing. You're seeing uh, some of the states, and I'm not going to get into the pol politics of anything. You see all this changing where they're outlawing the sales of everything. Uh, certain gasoline engines, uh, some of the lawn and garden stuff's going away. A lot of your chainsaws, they won't be allowed to be sold. I see it as an opportunity. Uh, there are millions and millions of chainsaws out there. They were made even back in the 70s that I see, still see running today. And what I'm getting at is, uh, if I was young, I'm not anymore, if I was young, I would just be all over that as far as getting into it. Learn, uh, learn really some good techniques, get some good tools, and you can repair these chainsaws, the small engines, from here to eternity. There's that many of them. Anyway, what I want to talk to you today, and just so you know, I, I don't live in my cabin anymore. I had a lot of acreage there at the cabin, and I had uh, riding lawnmowers and chainsaws of all sorts besides the ones I collected, and you've seen them on uh, videos, you've seen them on eBay. I don't sell eBay anymore. That's another thing I want to tell you guys. When you see a chainsaw guy saws for sale on eBay, it's not me. There's guys out there, you know, they got to put bread on the table, put bean on beans on the table, and, you know, they're using my name, and I haven't done anything. That's fine. Uh, you know, whatever. But anyway, it's not me on eBay. I used to sell on the YouTube side here. I don't do that anymore. I do help a lot of guys with their chainsaws and do videos on that. But I own, uh, I, you know, I was against all the battery stuff for years, just, just didn't want to do it, fought it all the way. Well, after moving to a smaller place, I actually got me a steel RM A460V. I have a very small yard, and it's just wonderful to use that. It takes me very, <clears throat> excuse me, takes very little time to mow with it. it does a beautiful job vacuuming. I even picked up one of these. I just love it. Got the steel uh, BGA 57. Love it. I also had the old gasoline when I had backpacks, handhelds, everything, you name it. Had them all. And they're good if you got a large, large property. You know, you do need the gasoline ones. That's what I'm getting at. For guys like me now that live in a small spot that don't have a lot of acreage to take care of, the, you know, the battery ones, they work great. What we're going to talk about today, though, is chainsaw parts. I know they're expensive. OEM stuff's expensive. And I always told you guys, told everyone, I don't believe in the aftermarket stuff. I just didn't like it. I've had a little change of attitude in that because I've seen some of the products. I've had them, guide the manufacturers will send me some of the stuff, and I've actually looked at it. And I got one sent to me today. I don't get paid for any of this, just so you know. I don't know what we're going to open up when we open up this package. I do know, then again, we're not getting into politics. It's from Taiwan, which on the label it says Republic of China. Well, if you watched any of the news, Going going on these this day and age, they're trying to get away from anything to do with China, and they, they make some really good products there. So anyway, just got the box in. We're gonna open it up. We're gonna take a peek at it and compare it a little bit to the Husqvarna OEM stuff. And it took me probably this came direct from Taiwan. It took probably a week to get. I don't know what they sell for. I don't think they're really expensive, but they're not the real low end stuff. We'll open it up, see what's in it here. I know a lot of you guys are considering getting out of the small engine repair, and I really think that would be a bad mistake. Like I said, there's so much opportunity at this time. They sent me an air cleaner too, I see. And just a minute, let me get something here. I'm going to... Uh, I built these pre-filters for years. I sold them to all you guys, a lot of guys, especially on the fires. Um, very popular. The pre-filter that wraps around the air filter. And this is their filter. Good looking filter. And this would actually fit right over 
oil it with some tacky oil, fit right over. And for guys working on the fires, the wildfires, it was just ideal. I haven't finished manufacturing it, but ideal for your uh, keeping the horrible carbon dust and everything out of your saw. You oil these up, two or three of these. I may start manufacturing them again. I haven't decided that yet or not. We'll see. But anyway, that's just a <coughs> good way to save your engine. Box in a box. Got their part number on there. It's a big bore one. 372 big bore. And that was something that went away. Uh, I was there when it first came into being made was the 372 big block OEM. It went from a 70, 71 cc up to the 74 point something. It's almost 75 cc. Last run of the 372 XP uh, Western Edition. Or, uh, it's just a beautiful saw. Powerful. You can modify it, do all kinds of things with it. And of course that went away. The part number stayed the same for the big bore, but very confusing for a lot of Husqvarna dealers who weren't familiar with that, and they would order in that cylinder under that part number for the big bore, and of course it not fit. I mean it would fit, but it was a small displacement. Let's take a look at this. That's my uh, a cutaway, it's for uh, when I would give lessons on importing chainsaws, that's what we used right there. Very well packaged. A piece of foam to hold that piston in. Beautiful. Very nice. I want to show you something else. Uh, you'll be just a minute here on, on how you can uh, modify these and really get some performance on them. But yeah, that's a that's a good job. Ports are clean. I know you can't see in there very well. Ports are clean. I don't see any burrs. I've seen a lot of these aftermarkets, not this manufacturer, but I've seen others that I just wouldn't put on a chainsaw because they were just so poorly made. Unbelievably poorly made. This one is very clean on the ports. They've cleaned them all up. It's very nice. You don't see any, uh, what I would call, slaggish overflow on it. I mean, just very nice. Got the decompression port right there. Very nice. And the piston. Boy, isn't that beautiful? My goodness. Two ring. Beautiful. Super smooth. They've cleaned them all up. You just don't see that on a lot of you. When you, if you buy one of these cylinder kits for you know twenty bucks, thirty bucks, you look real close compared to this, and you're going to see all kinds of where they haven't cleaned up the uh, where that was manufactured. They haven't cleaned anything up. It's not polished at all. Very nice. Keepers were always an issue. You know, it's something I, I'm a little leery of using those. I probably would switch those out with Husqvarna OEM just because I feel like they would stay in better, but they look to be pretty good quality. You always want to check the tension on them. This pin looks really polished, very nice. in there just like it should. If you like how they ship the rings in a little package there, isn't that nice? You can get them open, they're so packed so good. Beautiful, beautiful. 
very nice and there are those high performance rings are a little thinner very nice and what you do with this when you when you're doing this slide the ring in there square it up get your feeler gauge check the clearance on that gap up and down the cylinder several different places by measuring that you can tell how good a job they did and just by eyeballing it without using my gauges I can tell you that's it's a premium job very nice I want to show you something else here just hang tight I got to dig it out show you here. <clears throat> this is what my machinist used. I years ago started out doing the lathe work myself and uh, I'll tell you, you got to be precision. If you don't get this squared up perfectly, I mean perfectly, you're going to have all kinds of issues. And of course you want to check your squish. Here guys talking about that. Always want to use a, a gauge to check your squish. Squish is being how close that piston gets to the top. And you also get the pop-up pistons. I believe this manufacturer does make some pop-ups. I've seen them before. I don't know the quality of those. You can quiz them and see. Highway is the name of the outfit. They're on the internet, uh, very knowledgeable, knowledgeable people, and they do get back with you, very good people. But these are the mandrels that were made for my cylinders. And I had a, this is all the ones that I did. There was every saw that was really sought after. 044, MS 441s, uh, big blocks. Even the big boys, they're mandrels. And what the machinist would do, would chuck that in his lathe, of course, put the dead spot stop against here, put his gauge down on the, where you turn your, rotate into, with your lathe into where you're cutting this, and uh, a good safe amount to take off is the thickness of your gasket, a new gasket. So what you would do is measure a new OEM gasket, whatever it comes out as, 18 thousandths, whatever. That's what you want to take off. Now there's other guys I know, I've seen some of their work. They would take 20 thousandths and they're really pushing it, 25, whatever. Pretty soon, and with the expansion of the heat of the aluminum, it would actually, for a minute minute there or a little time that would actually piston top touch the top of the cylinder where your squish is at and you could actually sometimes I could actually hear it when it was doing that it's only gonna last for a short time I mean you might get her squeezed down we actually when I was doing my own machining years ago we used to do the pioneers and they got the nickname for them they were called the pop tops after so much running it would actually crack the top of the cylinder and of course take out the cylinder and of course what I was doing was not getting the squish where it would compensate for that so that's just a rule of thumb I know guys will do everything you can you can build a pop-up you can shave shave the piston uh, do different things um, when we first started doing this years ago we actually didn't do any cylinder work we did all the work on our piston we would trim the skirts on the uh, intake side and uh, take the top of the piston on the exhaust and angle it a little bit to get the exhaust out a little faster and then I seen some all kinds of crazy things done there was people drilling holes in the pistons and, and then it got really crazy some of the work I seen it was just bizarre and that's when I went to get a quality machinist to help me and then we what I wanted to build was a reliable yet high performance chainsaw that would last. And that's what I was seeing a lot of, is the guys were just getting these saws to just scream, changing the timing more than they should. Some of those saws were just unbelievable. There was one guy here locally that was welding onto lobes onto the crankshaft counterbalance, reshaping them, claiming he could balance them. And the first one I ran, 
I told the guy that he was complaining and his hands were hurting. I said, well, your saw's out of balance. I mean, you can't even hold on to it. He said, well, I just had it balanced. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they welded lobes onto the counterbalances there and it's supposed to be more high performance. We tore that thing down and it was, it had been gas welded with br brass and he tried to shape it and of course it wasn't balanced and it was shaken apart when, and the saw with all the screws coming out and he's getting hairline cracks everywhere. So we changed out the crank and I did a little bit of work onto it and he was just happy as a lark and I kept that crank for years. I don't have it anymore but I would show guys the things you're not supposed to do. But, but anyway, that's just some of the do's, don'ts and everything. Uh, anyway, I did want to show you, like I said, all the different mandrels. There's the trick tool and your tool stop that you would put in there to shave. Custom built. Reaching in there to shave it. A little bit goes a long ways, guys. Just remember that. I mean, there was all kinds of them I had built. And this was an expanding one here. I didn't build them. My machinist did. He was a very good machinist. He'd build these and I would take them over there and he'd shave them for me. We call it shaving. And do, just do a fabulous job. Well, I've got to tell you, I'm very impressed with this cylinder. Very impressed. And if you want to do some porting on these, what I would do, and of course, you've got to have a tool that has a foot pedal, foot pedal, so you can control the speed when you're when you're shaving or porting when you're porting these ports and different things if you get a foot pedal control porting tool CNC makes one I can't remember the last name CNC foot pedal uh, hangs on a pedestal um, interchangeable you gotta have the left turning and right turning uh, cutters as well as the handheld piece gotta turn left right you would shave that exhaust on the upper side inside this port inside that port you'd reach in there and you would gently shave that 20 thousandths why 20 thousandths? trial and error after building a lot of these engines I knew found out what would be the best for longevity not so much high performance for a day or two but longevity and then you would clean that up with a lighter bit taper it when that pistons going up and down that ring actually bulges into this area it'll actually bulge into that as it goes up that ring will actually come out and go back in go back go back you want a smooth transition so if you get that not tapered and kind of rough, I've seen some just hog out way too much. That ring will clip part of the window and pretty soon it'll take out the piston, cylinder, whatever. Transfers. You want to reach in there and you want to clean that. Now they've got this a dam, it's called a dam. You can see how it tapers there. That speeds up the flow of the molecular, the little components of the fuel mixture and everything, speeds it up. If you had that flat, a lot of guys will just cut that flat, you don't want that. You want it to tumble and flow into the firing, I call it the firing chamber, the top of the piston there when it finally fires. You want that stuff really worked up. You never want to polish the intake. A lot of guys say, well, I always polish the intake. Well, don't. If you're going to polish anything, you're going to polish the exhaust. You want that, the idea behind that is to get the exhaust out as fast and as much as you can. Polished, it'll flow out better. You want to match to your exhaust. None of that welding those pipes. I welded pipes on, but you, if you ever seen any of mine, there was no slag. It was just mere finish. I've seen some of the guys on YouTube here weld some god-awful pipes on there and you can see the globs of weld everywhere and you know what's going to happen. It's going to suck right back into that exhaust. I've seen it happen and you don't want that going to the side of your piston cylinder and scattering it. So if you're going to weld them, 
use a nickel rod and uh, you got silver solder, silver, silver nickel is what it's called. You weld it with that and then you polish it and you feel for any any bit of slag or anything with your finger you don't want anything that can cause an issue. Not only do you want it smooth but you don't want it going back into your engine. So you go do the transfer ports. You've already decked it and the intake you're going to want to take as the piston goes up you need more volume quicker so you do the bottom depends on how you're looking at the cylinder trim it 20 thousandths taper it just like we did on the exhaust hog it out a little bit not a bunch hog it out with the slow moving bit then again if you're not using a foot pedal and you are trying to do this with a Dremel tool that's turning 12, 15,000 RPM, you're going to plug up that tool bit, tool, the cutter. You're going to be constantly fighting that. The trick to all this porting and to get it done efficiently is the speed. Slower the better. If you go slow with a foot pedal, barely get that, I mean, it just barely turns. You're going to see aluminum chips just coming off faster than you can imagine. You put, put a pedal all the way down, crank it up to 8, 10 grand, Instantly plugs up, everything slows down, you, you're fighting it, you're heating up the aluminum, causing all kinds of issues. That's another thing you don't want to do when you're doing this. You don't want to create heat and deform or change the characteristics of the plating. That's something you don't want to do. Guys, like I say, I like the uh, Highway brand. I think that's a good one. I would be afraid to put that on a uh, 372. But when you do that, before you go to all this work, press your vacuum test. Make sure you've got a good candidate. You don't want to do a saw that's blown up. You need to find out why it blew up. Determine if it was an air leak, fuel issue. If your vents plug up, fuel filter plugs up, fuel hose acts up. You've got a fuel-related starvation, which will take out your very nice port job. So make sure you cure all the issues why that saw went down before you decide to do this. I learned that the hard way many years ago. We didn't have all the tools that we had this day and age to pressure vacuum test, do everything. Guy, timber cutter, brings a saw in and just wants a barrel and piston put on it, slap it on, next day it comes back up, smoked again. And it didn't take me long to learn that I better figure out what's going on. And after doing that, I would always, even with a, they bring in a saw that was seized up i wouldn't tear it down i would pressure vacuum test do all go through all my testing determine why it went down fix it and then you've got a candidate for doing a repair well that's all for today fellas have a great day and we'll catch you later